Welcome to the Real Estate Fight Club, a podcast for agents where you'll witness a battle of opinions about topics affecting your real estate business. Now, always in your corner, here are your hosts, Jen Mertland and Monica Weekly. Welcome to another episode of Real Estate Fight Club. What's up, Jay Mert? Man, this is going to be a great one. I'm excited for today. We are I'm lucky. Hot. Lucky. We have a very special guest today. So I can, I don't know if you and I are going to duke it out on this one. I imagine that we will. No, me and me and Tim pretty much see eye to eye. So I think you're going to be fighting us. <laughs> this is what oh, I'm cool. afraid of. <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, let's oh. introduce our guest, Tim Harris. One half yeah. of the very popular Tim and Julie Harris. Yeah. Uh, hey. You might know him from real estate training and coaching school podcast. I mean, you might know him from his, their, very wildly popular book, Harris Rules. Welcome, Tim, to Real Estate Fight Club. Hey. Hey, Club, Tim. Huh? Let's so let's see what you gals got. Let's get the gloves on. <laughs> yeah. Did you bring your gloves? Because you don't need them. We go, we go just fists here. It's ugly. Oh, it's raw. Yeah. No yeah, lie, no foul. I like it. Yeah. That's right. That's right. So Jen, you seem to think that Tim is Team Mertlin. Yes. So Tim, I think, I mean, I'm sure everybody knows the book, the Harris rules book, but I did. Can you just briefly? Yeah. And if you're watching yeah. on YouTube, he's wearing his hat and I don't, I guess my biggest question is, is none of those rules to me seem to change based, um, since the pandemic, but can you go over the rules like briefly with, with the audience and tell them where to get the book? Mm, you're assuming I have them all memorized in order, which I absolutely do not. <laughs> I was that assuming that. That makes I it do better. Not. So can I tell you something funny though about the book? Yeah. Um, so Julie and I outlined the book together. So we wrote down all the chapters and then we wrote down all the sub points. You know, that's how you organize a book. Right. And we, and then a publisher contacted us and Julie then started working directly with, it's like four different people that were constantly, you know, basically managing her publishers, copy editors, all this, just a lot of work, just a tremendous amount of work. It took her, like, she would probably spend... I don't know, maybe for a year, like 10 hours a week on it. It was a huge amount of work. But remember, mm -hmm. all I did was sit down with her over a cup of coffee and wrote the chapters down the sub points. Yeah. So the book finally gets published. And then when you look for it on Amazon, it shows up because we it's Tim and Julie. It just shows up Tim Harris and oh. Julie Harris. And it cuts, oh and it cuts off her name. But the truth is, the truth is she did like 90% of the work. Well, so I think like, what I like about it too, it's just... I mean, there's a lot of rules to being successful and it talks about how to be successful in business in general and in real estate. And there's, there's all these rules, but you guys got it narrowed down to like very kind of like simple steps. And it's like, okay, what do we do? If we're going to be in real estate, the average realtors in business for three years, right? How do we make it to five and how do we be successful doing that? Well, here it's the average agents in business for 24 months and most yeah. of them bail out after 24 months. Yeah. But here's a fun stat and I'll get the numbers wrong, but you get the gist of it. Something like, uh, we get along. I just made right, stuff up well, too. Yeah. Asked, oh, exactly. <laughs> 95, 95 95% of all transactions in 60 months are going to be done by agents who do not yet, or people who do not yet have real estate licenses. Right. Wow. I didn't think about that. Wow. Because so, of everybody so world, getting out and everybody getting in. Where are well, we going? Because, well, so, so, so going back to trying to make it so you guys can get your dukes up. So the question you have to ask yourself is considering that there's always been a high failure rate in any business. So 24 months is the average amount of time that any business, according to this SBA, stays in business. Doesn't matter if it's a pie shop or whatever it is, right? 24 months, people fizzle out. Um, so why is it that the failure rate in real estate amongst real estate agents, the amount of time they're spending in the industry as not 24 months is actually shortened and the advent of all the technological branding, uh, all the, you know, Mickey Mouse that goes on with regards to social networking. Why is it that when we, when we we're moving towards this era where there should be more opportunities for people to be more successful, that, that fewer people are being successful. And the answer isn't teams. Yes, I know. Ma <laughs> because they don't work. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, basically they don't do what they don't want to do when they don't want to do it at the highest level. Someone is convinced, <laughs> someone has convinced them that basically making a bunch of TikTok videos 
is going to make the phone ring right. consistently, opposed to literally just making your own damn phone ring right now. Right. Right. Exactly. Team Merlin. Hey there. You liking this video? Go ahead and hit subscribe so you get all the latest videos. And I told you. <laughs> Tim, how long have you been selling real estate? I, Julie and I haven't sold real estate in a long time. We were- I mean, uh, when did you start? I know you guys aren't in production. Early 90s. Where I, I mean, yeah. I'm 52 and Julie's, I'm not allowed to say her age, but let's okay. just say that we knew each other in high school and I was a year older. <laughs> um, so we've been, we've been married You're for 31 joking. We've been married for 31 years this year. We sold real estate. We, we bought our first investment property when we were basically right out of college. Uh, I wish we still had it, you know? Yeah, I mean, oh my God. Right? I mean, we bought it for 71 grand and it's probably worth two or 350. I have a property that I bought in uh -huh. 2009 and I bought it for $35,000 and I still own it. I've literally put in maybe $5,000 in it. It is- What could you sell it like, for today? I don't, I don't know because I'm not going to, <laughs> it's like, I've only had two total tenants in there the whole time. It's the best. Well, oh but God. this, this all goes back to like Harris rules, right? So yeah. like if there, there's the thing I've learned, um, I'll bounce, I'll, we're going to bounce around until you guys reel me in. Okay. okay. So, so one, one, <laughs> of the, one of the things, one of the things, uh, at my, uh, I'm at the halfway point at 52 <laughs> and, and one of the things I've learned is that very few people are willing to do what they don't want to do when they don't want to do it at the highest yes. level. Very okay. few people are willing to actually learn the skills necessary. Very few people are willing to stay the, stay the course, even when they don't have passion or, you know, whatever. Very few people are actually willing to put in the real work, which I believe was your point. Right. Um, and then furthermore, very few people are really, and, and this is a psych, you know, most people can't see themselves into the future, right? Yeah. So, so most people have an impossible time of seeing what their future selves will be like. And that's the reason that the average American only has $400 saved or something horrible oh, like God. that. So, mm -hmm. so, so the reality of it is, is that most, eight, uh, you make your money um, doing things that are more speculative, but when you have profit, assuming you have profit, which most real estate agents and brokerages don't, because they spend it all on branding and buying leads. Yeah. But yeah. What, once you progress forward with the profit, then you reinvest in things that are super conservative and safe. But what do agents do? They do things that are highly speculative in the front end to generate the money. Mm -hmm. And then they don't have really much profit and left what's left over. And with the profit that's left over, they do things that are equally highly Stupid. speculative. And then they end up with nothing. Right. So, exactly. so the way to the way to accumulate money is the way Warren Buffett does it. You know, you got to do it. Here, here's a fun fact. It what would over the last 10 years, where would you have made more money? The S&P 500 index funds are investing in uh, starting out the same amount of money uh, today till then, uh, you know, 10 years till today. Where would you have made more money, the S&P 500 or crypto? I mean, I want to say the S&P 500, but that's probably wrong. Probably crypto. Well, no, it's not. Because crypto crypto right? went up and now it's come back down. Oh, right. Agents, You'd have to right. pull it out. Right, right, yeah. right. Yeah. right. And, most, and most people didn't sell it. They're hodling and hoping that it's going to come back around. Got uh, it. And, and if any crypto people watch this, they're going to be all over what I just said and try to shish kebab me, you know, that's okay. that's just the way. <laughs> that's all right. But, but, right. But the truth is the S&P 500, if you invested in index funds, it's going to double basically every seven or eight years. Mm -hmm. So when you, when you make profit from your real estate business, buy what you did, buy what Jules and I've done for the last 30 years, buy rental properties, and then invest it in something as simple as the S&P uh, 500 index fund from Vanguard, not, you know, there it is. Mm -hmm. You do your own yeah. homework, obviously, but, right, but, right, this, right. but frankly, this is the reason that EXP, where is it? Yeah, there. Yeah. Or, oh. or, or, <laughs> it is. Right. This is so why this, we're all there. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, but yes, EXP, right. uh, is, EXP is a massive wealth accelerator because it took Julie and I buying rental properties all over. We have them in seven different states and it took us decades, you know, to get to the point where we had X amount of passive revenue created from these rentals, most of which were paid off. We were able to surpass that in EXP revenue share inside two and a half, well, really about two years, two and a half years. That's so we're crazy. making more money off revenue share. Well, it's, yeah. it's the eighth greatest wonder great. of the world, right? Yeah. I mean, it is. It is. It is. It is. Nine, it's incredible. Ten. <laughs> all right. All right. Let me reel, let me reel back into a question I have for you, Tim, because you talked about when you got started back in the nineties, I think mm -hmm. you said, tell me the like top one or two mistakes that you made as you fumbled through your early years. Cause you have all this knowledge now and all this experience and you've packaged it up and nice in a book and a podcast, but I'm quite sure that it wasn't without falling on your face a couple of times. So what, what did you do if you're being vulnerable that 
you could save our listeners from making the same mistake? Wow, that's such a good question. I got such a boring answer. What is so, it? so I'll give you another Warren Buffett quote too. America loves to celebrate the comeback story and Warren Buffett likes to celebrate the business owner that created it, that never lost it, that can continue to build on it every year. Yes. But it. to answer your, and, and that's good, again, it's doing what you don't want to do and you don't want to do at the highest level. You know, we do our yeah. podcast every single day for a half hour. We have thousands of shows. 90% of the time, we don't feel like doing it. We still do it. Yeah. To answer your question, I'll say the biggest mistake we made. Our first year in the business, we sold 103 homes. Our second year, we did, I don't remember, it was over 100. Uh, and the third year, the, after our first year, we started getting a lot of attention. National Association of Realtors, uh, REMAX at the time. We started to fly to different areas. Basically, what happened was because we had broken all these records, and I think it's still a standing record, that we had a really, uh, and this was before the internet, remember? Yeah, <laughs> right? right. So this, and it was real, the big thing was the magazine you get from National Association of Realtors and Julie and I were featured in it. We've been, fe- you know, who cares? We had all this outsized attention and then we became Howard Brenton stars again, probably before both your gals time. And, I and the, okay, good. Yeah, hearing about it, it, yeah. Yeah, so, so we are Howard Brenton stars and then we started hanging out with other Howard Brenton stars. The other Howard Brenton stars, for the most part, were all, and this was back when the whole team concept and branding and marketing was really getting its uh, legs. So the branding and marketing stuff that you guys are, that everyone's basically spending, wasting, frankly, a lot of money on right now, that all got started back in the 90s. So Julie and I would go to these, uh, you know, top end agent events that would happen in various places in the United States, always at Ritz Carlton's, you know, which was shockingly expensive back then still. And, mm-hmm. and so we would we'd go to these events and we'd be sitting in a room with 50 or 75 of the nation's top agents based on their volume. And all of them, with a few exceptions, all of them were leaning into, oh, this marketing and branding thing. And they're rationalizing it. Well, we can get our time back and it's better if I can form a business and I can form the bit, all these things that are saying that have become gospel nowadays. But what what Julie and I started doing that. So in our third year, we, we hired buyer's agents. In our third year, we started doing some marketing and branding. And then I remember it was, it, it was somewhere like April of our fourth year, if you're following along, and we're doing our taxes. It may have been actually been October because we always, you know, extended. <laughs> well, like, yeah. but, I, I, but I remember our accountant came over to our house and he, his name was Fred. And he sat down with us, didn't say anything. He showed us our returns for the past three years. And what he was showing us was we had more net profit our first year in the business than we did in the previous year where we were basically doing what everyone was telling us. Now, our business uh, in terms of revenue had almost doubled, but our net profit had uh, dropped. So that after yeah. that, we made that mistake and, after, and we didn't buy any rental properties that year either. So after that, Julie and I quickly realized that the path that we need to stay on is the path where we're going to be able to have enough income coming from paid off passive income sources because we didn't have to, we didn't want to have to be transactional our entire right. lives. Hey guys, it's Monica here. I am so excited to introduce you to Real Estate Fight Club's newest partnership, Cyberbacker. Cyberbacker is the best in the business for virtual assistants. How do I know this? Because I am a Cyberbacker customer and I love this company. I have my favorite, Frances. She is my cyberbacker, been with me for over a year. She's amazing. She makes me better. She's eager to help. She's on time. She's disciplined. She's awesome. And this company, Cyberbacker, has figured out the system from the interviewing process to find out what I need, to the interviewing process to interview several cyberbackers, to the onboarding process, to the training process. Very buttoned up, very awesome. You and I both know it's time for you to leverage. It's time for you to take that step. And Cyberbacker is a really safe, awesome solution. Make sure to mention Fight Club and you will be getting a free gift. All right, do it. Make the call. See ya. You know, you didn't want to die showing at a doorstep, showing a house when you're like a hundred years old, like my (laughs) agent's retirement plan. (laughs) <laughs> well, you know, it, you're reminding me of a, a, a clubhouse that I did um, beginning of last year. I'll never forget this one. This guy who was somehow connected with Julie and I from, I don't know how, podcast probably. He, he was probably, I'm guessing, in his 60s. And the, the topic was, would you rather be rich or would you rather be famous? You can't be both. Okay. Would you rather be rich, famous? That's easy. Get, well, for me too and for you. Okay. <laughs> it's rich, right? Yeah, rich. So, 
But rich is free, right? Rich is where your money works for you. You no longer have to work for your money. It's simple. Yeah. Rich isn't millions of dollars. Rich could just be ten thousand dollars a month coming in passively. We so live like, in Ohio. Personal. It absolutely is. <laughs> I'm from Columbus, Ohio. Trust me, sister. That's right. I know. He's a fellow Buckeye. Yes. Yeah. I mean, Julie yeah. and I met at Worthington High School. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Yeah. Nice. All right. So, so, well, actually the alternative campus, if you guys know, so know that is anyway, so uh, you got me off my story. What was I telling you? The guy in clubhouse. No, oh, yeah, clubhouse. Yeah. So, yeah. Rich. thank you. So this guy, right. So this guy gets on and he starts telling his story because uh, he understood my point urgently immediately. And so he said, Tim, when I was in my twenties, um, I was a buying business and I was all about essentially uh, making myself famous. Mm -hmm. uh, and then when I was in my 30s, I felt I was doing the same thing. Billboards, bus benches, uh, you know, mm -hmm. uh, moving trucks, mm -hmm. all this ego, branding and marketing Ego, stuff. ego, ego, ego. Mm -hmm. 100%. Yes. And then into his 40s, he said, then he starts, he said he started to kind of have that pivot in his mind because he realized everyone knew who he was. And he was famous and everyone, and he was selling crap tons of houses and had this big team and he could peacock around. And he said, he began to realize the fallacy in that pursuit mm -hmm. because he did, he was tall hat, no cattle. We lived in Texas. That basically means you're all show and no go. Right. Yeah. You know, right. you walk around this pretty Stetson on that costs like $1,400, but you don't have any cattle. No. Right. <laughs> and right. Anyway, so, so that, you know, that's, that's what he was relaying. And then he said, when I got into my fifties and then he said now, so this is the reason I thought he was in his sixties. He said, it was my biggest regret not having actually um, it was very gratuitous towards us. It was my biggest regret not focusing on essentially doing what you, you and Julie are, you know, right. been talking about for 20 years. Yeah. Yeah. Cause it's, it's, it's time on, it's time on task over time, like consistent time on task. And that's it. Well, let me ask you this. Well, because, skills too, right? I well, mean, you yeah, you've got to, right? you have to know what the hell you're doing. Yeah, of course. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yep. So given you guys have been in real estate for a long time, what do you think at real estate's it feels like shift. There's a shift coming. What do agents need to know now to prepare for the next five years to be great okay. real estate agents? So first of all, the interest rates are going to have an effect, but do go to like uh, some mortgage calculator, you know, go to uh, success lending, right? Do a mortgage calculator and figure out- They don't know how to what... do math, Tim. Well, that's the reason I said use a calculator online. You know? <laughs> yeah. and, and, and then you'll realize how insignificant. So, so there's two different thoughts, right? Interest yeah. rates are going up, um, but how? what significance does that have on the average sale price of the average uh, buyer in, in the United States? And the answer is not much, mm -hmm. number one. Right. Okay, number two, uh, the question is really is how high, what will actually happen to interest rates? Because as the, Fed, as the rates rise, so does the cost of the debt service and the country currently owns what? Owes $23 trillion oh or whatever. Oh my God, yeah, whatever. So the, the country has to make those debt payments. And if the rates go up, what's going to happen is they're, they're going to have to A, increase taxes and B, they're going to have to then decide what they're not, who they're not going to be, you know, giving money out to, hey, right? Yeah. Right. So exactly. So they can't, the country won't, they, there's no, and, and there's no real, um, the, the reality of it is, is it's almost impossible for rates to go up in a meaningful way. So for them, for agents to be having any over emotional reaction to rates is, I think, unfounded. You know, a year from now, let's find out. But that's, and I think the whole Ukraine thing is going to give um, the government an excuse and the Fed an excuse not to raise rates anymore. Mm -hmm. But let's just say rates are, let's say the rate at the end of the year is five, five and a half percent. It won't have a meaningful difference in the housing market. Here's where, it's gonna, and here's why. And the demographics are so strong for home buyer, uh, home buying and transacting right now. It's never been like this in history before. Right. Everyone talks about the demographics of the baby boomers and they generation X. You guys are all generation X. Nobody cares about us. Good, right? Mm -hmm. and, then, and, then there's the, and then there's the millennials. There's so many more millennials than there are baby boomers and generation X. And they're all either buying their first homes or they're moving up to their second homes, right? They're in their early 40s. Their, their now first home is really the price of like a second or third home, it feels <laughs> like. I mean, they're buying like crazy priced houses. 300, 400, yeah. Well, well you, guys, you guys understand that the end, at the end of the year, it's projected, and it's going to happen. It already, some people are saying it's already true. The average price in America for a home, not medium, average, is going to be close to 500 grand. But wow. do you think that. though that that's going to cause, and plus like the way that people are working now, it'll cause uh, a diff, like people will buy houses differently. What do you think about that? Like, start, what do you mean? Like, uh, like Airbnb or partial ownership. No, or, 
You don't no. think any of that will happen? No, no. I watch this Picasso thing and all the rest of it. I well, get Picasso's that. Picasso's like make... high end though. That's different. That's a timeshare sort of, right? Exactly. That's a timeshare. That doesn't really, but like, no, they're all back when there was, were you guys in real estate when there was a housing crash before in 07, 08? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. okay. So every time there's any kind, there's, there's a faction of humanity that doesn't want, that wants housing, this is going to be really controversial, but I don't care, wants housing to be socialized. And they don't, they, they don't think that there should be the, uh, that's basically it, that there's somehow, there needs to be a redistribution of how, as you know, certain people can buy, certain people can't buy, and there needs to be some kind of government oversight on how, you know, the whole thing. So you got to be careful when you're starting to take in um, information that's implying that the American dream is not to own a home and won't always be to own a home. What all of our goals should be is help as many people to buy homes as possible Mm -hmm. because real estate is consistently the best wealth creator, at least in the past, since the 50s. hundred and no, even longer. It's been Mm -hmm. at least a hundred years that it's been. Well, so, but here's, here's the real bugaboo in all of this. Uh, And this is good for real estate. It's bad for everything else. Inflation. Inflation is, so the average cost to build a new home. Can you guys hear that? I turned on a fan. You can't, Mm-mm, hopefully. No. Okay. No. The average cost to build a home. It's getting a hot in here. Take off those gloves. <laughs> exactly. The <laughs> average cost to build a new, I went, I'm waiting for her to uh, talk about marketing and advertising so we can shish kebab her. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> talk <laughs> about TikTok, I dare you. Okay. <laughs> so, so, uh, so, um, the average cost to build a new home in the mainland is uh, gone up 30% and it's increasing. Julie yeah. and I live in Puerto Rico. The average cost of new construction here is up 60% and increasing. Remember, wow. this is the spring of 2022, right? Right. Mm-hmm. So what's that going to do to the value of resale homes if new construction is so much more expensive? It's going to pull it up, right? Yeah, mm-hmm. right. So, so inflation is going to be right now, and we've been, Jules and I have been saying this for at least two years, every single human should be buying a house on a 30 year uh, fixed rate mortgage yes. urgently, even if they have to pay something close to 5%, yeah. because the inflation rate is going to, is more than that by a significant margin. And arguably in real estate, it's double that. Yeah. Uh, Goldman Sachs predicted that values of homes by the end of this year in the mainland would go up uh, 16%. They've already gone up by 16%. So you're looking for houses to hypothetically go up by 20%. Next year, they're going to inflate you guys can call it appreciation, but they're going to inflate by another, who knows, four to 10%. So if you've mm-hmm. got a mortgage that's even 5%, the, int- the the house is going to increase in value more than what your total holding cost of that house is. You're living for free. Mm-hmm. Right? And you mm-hmm. can even factor in maintenance and upkeep and leaking roofs and all that other crap. You're still living for free. This is the smartest time ever to buy a house because of inflation. And then so people take all say, the money you're buying and paying for leads and stop immediately and buy <laughs> houses. I, okay, well, you got, let's let's talk about buying leads. Explain to me, do you guys know what's happening with the whole buying lead scheme, basically? That got started in 2007, 2008. Look at the cost that agents are willing to pay for leads. Send it charges, what, over 50% now for a referral fee? I know Zillow's going to be charging more. All these companies are charging more. Even if you're really, really smart and you're an EXP and you're an EXP agent and your cap is $16,000. If you factor in how much, you know, you're an 80-20 split. If you factor in how much the average agent is making net when they're paying these fat referral fees that are just increasing, you make no profit. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Stop it immediately. Stop. (laughs) You know, as we're talking about all of these market factors, I think what's interesting to me in a conversation I'm sure we all are having all the time is most agents want to do, the average agent wants to do, I don't know, 12 to 36 deals a year. We're not all looking to do 100 deals or whatever. There will always be a dozen, two dozen, three dozen people that you know that are moving that will use you. Like that, we have to um, also not give agents this opportunity to point at everything in the market as to why they're not having success because the market doesn't dictate our success. It just dictates the strategy, right? So where does that come into play with all this stuff? This information is so interesting, but how do we make sure agents don't like use that as an excuse? I'll tie that question into your previous question. It's fascinating to me to watch right now as inflation kicks in, as rates rise, People in the stock market are panicked. Julie and I know a lot of guys that are invested in hedge funds or own their own hedge funds. We know a lot of money people 
and they're taking write downs on their investments. So there's all kinds of money uh, that's being lost right now, what's happening in the world. But it's fascinating to me to notice the people that are focused on that versus the people that are focused on the opportunities mm -hmm. that are created during a changing market. Mm -hmm. and, and I would say right now, and Julie and I live in a very interesting area in Dorado, Puerto Rico. I would say that um, it, it's almost like 50% uh, of the people are focused on the negative. The problem is, is if you start thinking about the negative and you start having you know negative headlines swimming around your head, you're going to stop. You're going to actually, I hate the word manifest, but you're going to manifest negative in your life. That's right. So what, you, what you've really got to do is you've got to prune from your life right now and become very myopic, you know, tunnel vision. And you got to prune from your life anything that's negative. Yep. Because, the, because who wants you to, who benefits from you guys? And don't say nobody. Who benefits from you guys, benefits from you guys thinking negative thoughts? Anybody who pessimistic. wants to control you. Yeah. Correct. So who would anybody that be? Wants to I mean, the government. <laughs> well, but, but people that Other want agents. You, okay, <laughs> but listen, it's people that want Me. you to be dependent, not yeah. independent, right? Right, mm -hmm. right. It's people, but but see, right. this this circles back. What's your product of your real estate business? It's profit, mm -hmm. right? I mean, you know, mm -hmm. we talk about again. This is a big point in our book, but the product of your real estate business is profit. Any business is profit, unless you're running a nonprofit or you know you're venture funded and your sure. goal is to spend right. all the money and get more money. But your product of your real estate business is profit, and with that profit you then reinvested in things that make you passive income. The passive income, your goal, read our book, should be to essentially have enough money coming in every single month that you cover all your personal overhead. Again, EXP is the greatest wealth accelerator that we've ever seen in the real estate business. Yeah, um, for sure. By far, because mm -hmm. revenue share and because the way that uh, Glenn set up the stock thing, it's extraordinary. It's amazing. It is amazing. It really is. This. Well, I know. Okay, I want to honor your time too, yeah. Tim. I don't know if you see, I know you need to go. Yeah, I got three one minutes. Your fabulous. Yeah. Podcast. How can our listeners kind of track with you and tune in? Certainly they can follow your, uh, listen to your daily podcast. I mean, that's massive that you do that because we do one a week and it's a lot. I don't know. Uh, you get, but you get the, if you guys did it every day, you get in the flow of it. That's you know? true. Yeah. yeah. It's called real estate training and coaching school. How else can they reach you? Uh, I mean, that's Instagram. They can message okay. us through Instagram or frankly, they can text me too. It's my real cell phone number, you know, um, and just text. Don't call if you, I, I, the phone never rings. I just, you know, if you call, it's going to go to voicemail and the voicemail yeah. says, don't call text. So, but if they want to, if they want to get in uh, contact, yeah. I mean, you know, just text. It's not that hard. Right. Um, 512-758-0206. 512-758-026. That's my cell phone number. They can text. Or they can just message us through Instagram. That's why. Wait, are you time. building your brand on Instagram? Hold on, marketing and branding on Instagram? Oh. No, oh. not really. Oh, Go oh. oh. oh hold on oh, a second. No. You, you, oh, you right at I'm, the end, Monica. Okay, you, at the you end. You know why I'm doing it? You know why, why? Julie and I are doing it? Why? Well, it's, it, it's because we do. We work out every day, and we have a lot of coaching clients that work out every day, and we post pictures of Julie and I doing things we absolutely hate doing: kettlebells. <laughs> And we post videos and pictures of it and people love to watch us suffer. And so we put those up every day or we put pictures up of Zoe, our daughter, or just That's different great. things like that. But so I, your brand is miserable worker outers. Uh, <laughs> That's your but, brand. But, but listen, okay. Do it anyway. So she, no, 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 no. Since you brought it up, she's trying to pick a fight. That's fine. <laughs> so, so let me ask you, what's the difference between the word brand and reputation? Nothing. Do, 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 do. Nothing. Nothing. Bullshit. What? That's what is bullshit. It? What is because it? Because reputation is something you earn. A brand is something that people tell you you can buy, and in doing so, you'll have a reputation. Now, what people are trying. I, was, I, I understand what you're saying. I do not. I coach to that you cannot force your brand. That you must build your brand through action, and that is in, in essence reputation. So I think that's why I answered it that way because that's how I look at brand. Okay, I, I can't argue with that. That makes sense. Okay, no, that makes sense. You're 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 saying it honestly, okay? But mm -hmm. the reality of it is, is you can spend as much money as you want to trying to fool the world into thinking that you're successful when you're not. That is basically Instagram, right? Yeah. And you can spend all this money, all this effort trying to convince people some that you're this thing. You're trying to portray yourself to be this thing. All the while, you're just essentially a marketer, right? That's what right. most branding is. Would we agree? Right. Yeah. Agreed. Okay. Would you think, and we're all from Ohio, so we all have the same values. Do you think that's really ethical? 
no, convincing no. people that you're something. Yeah, neither do I. No, it's a so false the, front. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's a lie. So yeah. I think so, your brand should be dictated by your people. It should be authentic. By your you, clients, you, just by your you just, okay, now see, we're in agreement. So I just brought you guys together. It's peace. Oh, <laughs> okay, we don't even so have you, a podcast anymore now. You guys, <laughs> do you guys know who Charlie Munger is? I don't no. think so. Okay, Charlie Munger, this is the third Warren Buffett tie-in. <laughs> He's Warren Buffett's partner. And oh, yes, he said, okay. Yep. He, said, he said, don't try to make your self famous. Try to make the results you get for other people famous. In other words, yes. don't focus on your personal brand. Focus on the results you get for other people. Yes. That's called your reputation. Yes. So if you solve a bunch of other people's problems, in this case, it's helping them buy or sell real estate, right? Mm -hmm. If you solve those problems over time, you're going to have a great reputation you can't skip the step of knowing what to do and the people that you're helping by trying to, and this is, this is the lie that's being told. People are being told to, you know, go and create a bunch of TikTok videos and create a bunch of Instagram. This is, and this is the other things. And eventually people are going to be fooled into believing that you're the ultimate problem solver all the while. That's a lie. Unless you're obviously doing it. Right. Did you see what Will Smith did last night at the um, Oscars? I don't watch the Oscars. You couldn't pay me to watch the Oscars, but I listened to Ben Shapiro today and I heard him talking about it. Yes. Yes. And so to me, I wonder how that's going to affect his brand because he has built this brand on um, kind of everything but that. It's been interesting. It'll be interesting. But, but see, so you're, 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 look, I don't disagree with the premise of what you're saying. What I'm saying is, Monica, people younger than us, they don't understand because they've grown up in this world where everything's digital. Like our daughter's eight years old, right? So mm -hmm. for her to understand there's a reputation is something you earn. Brand is something that people selling branding, telling you that you can buy that will replace the need to actually earn the right to have a good reputation. That's all I'm saying. Got and it. by the so way, I think Will Smith's reputation will actually be better because in essence, he was uh, standing up for his wife. That, that's, I think you're hundred percent right. It's a conversation we had this morning. Yeah. Well, this has been amazing. Thank I've, you. Good. I've, uh, I feel like I've um, had a waterfall of information on me. Thank you for that. It's amazing. And I know our listeners are going to love this episode. So Tim, thank you. You're welcome. Appreciate <laughs> it. Thanks, My pleasure. Tim. All right. All right. Go Have bye guys. One. See you guys later. Bye. 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 bye.